Hi, I'm Marceline Gao, SciArc Channel producer, and tonight I'm here with architect Michael Hansmeier in conversation. Michael Hans Meyer is an architect and programmer known for exploring the use of algorithms and computation to generate architectural form. Recent projects include the sixth order installation of columns at the Guangzhou Design Biennale, the design and fabrication of full scale 3D printed grotto for Archilab 2013. Hans Meyer is currently a visiting professor at the Southeast University in Nanjing, and he has previously taught at the ETH in Zurich. Hans Meyer has also worked at the office of Herzog and Demeron architects. We're very happy to have Michael here tonight at SciArc in downtown Los Angeles. I'd like to start off by talking about an issue that I think relates closely to some of your recent work. It's something that we've been thinking about here also at SciArc and discussing in a lot of studios. Um, the issue is related to ideas of resolution and how we perceive forms, whether they're perceived as more continuous or something that has discontinuities. I think where this touches on some of your columns that you've done recently is the way in which the complexities of the surfaces are output into physical models. And so the form is built up through a series of thousands and thousands of layers. But there's something really compelling about the coexistence of the increment, depending on the thickness of the material that's being used, and the way that begins to approximate the curvature, but at the same time demonstrate that every curve is, in fact, discontinuous. I think we're, we're indeed shifting from a parametric approach to a more and more procedural one. And, and with that comes a less reliance on, on, on a predefined model that, that sets up and limits the scope of output. But um, it's a shift to more open-ended approaches with a wider scope of output. And, and with that comes the possibility of these multiple resolutions. So, so the idea that a single process can, can create both an, an overall form down to very, very small details which, which one can barely perceive. In terms of getting it out of the computer and, and, and slicing it, this, um, yeah, this is interesting when these, these models, which, which on the one hand are in this purely digital environment, are, uh, meet the forces of reality. Mm -hmm. We dealt with a lot of issues that we, we didn't anticipate. For one thing, burn marks from a laser cutter, which added, added some more information. Small pieces breaking off, just to name a few. And then, of course, the slicing that you mentioned that showed a trace of the fabrication mm -hmm. technique or, or added some more information also. Unfortunately, there was no feedback loop, so we didn't go back from the fabrication to, to the model, um, ah. which could have been interesting in terms of um, incorporating certain structural things we learned um, and in terms of maybe having different resolutions where, or, or thinner plates where, where we would have needed more resolution and so on. So that was a missed opportunity. What's very provocative and compelling about that choice of using the laser cutter that one could even decide to, to work with different thicknesses of yeah. materials in different areas to create, again, this idea of the patchiness or something where we feel that we're seeing a kind of edge of a surface or a curvature that is built up out of several increments. And the change in those increments may be making us aware of different tendencies of the form. Definitely. Uh, you, yeah. can, you can read much more information out, out of um, a layered model, I think, about the form. Um, and in that sense, this, this 3D printing is a yeah. double-edged sword in the sense that it's fantastic because you can, you can print anything. It's really, we're at the point where it's this whizzy wig, what you see is what you get. But on the other hand, um, you don't learn very much about what you're printing. The materiality is usually um, very homogenous. There's no trace, really, of the, of the manufacturing process. Some of the uh, surface intricacies with which you're working are so detailed that they're nearly imperceptible to the human eye. There's this issue of perception to the human eye, but what, what's equally interesting to me is, is just the haptic perception of it. No matter how many do not touch stickers we put on them, everybody touches the forms. So, which is nice, it's, it's a, in a way it's a compliment, um, it, but it's a way of people reading the form or, or discovering the form um, through, through touching it. And that was, that was also, I think, more the case with the columns and with the 3D printed work, because the columns have, I think, this, this additional layer of information through their layering. I've seen images of the x-ray view of the column and the fact that 
The interior is extremely complex, I guess equally as complex as what we're seeing on the exterior. And so this idea that some of those things are maybe really not revealed to us in a physical object, but then we can we can see them in the computational realm. That was very surprising. The software we were using was only visualizing the column on the outside. And then when we actually took the cuts, we saw, wait, wait a minute, this folding, this algorithm generated an entire world of things um, on, on the inside as well. Um, so we, we tried to map the inside to the outside, that was one possibility to, to, just to get a grip or to, to understand what was going on. Um, in the end effect, we had, we had to essentially cut it out um, or, or delete all of the interior just so we could produce it. But the, but the negative of the column is, I think, um, nonetheless an interesting space. We have the sheets. You can get into it because it's about 60 centimeters in diameter. So you can go inside with a very wide angle camera. And, and in a way, it's, it's, it's a much more interesting space than, than just standing among several columns or so. Because you really are enclosed by it because you're very close to it. You, 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 see, you see new things, um, especially if there's different lights in there producing shadows. It seems that your work also then challenges the conventional relationship between drawing and artifact. Normally, you know, the drawing is produced, the model is made from the drawing, but in your case, both are really required. One could never understand the project wholly, either through only viewing the digital model or only seeing its physical manifestation. One of the things that's, that, that, that is so new about this, the digital, and in particular the procedural, is that there, we don't design using drawings or sketches or plans and sections even, which is very different than, than how architects have traditionally produced or created their work. These only come at the very end as, as instructions for the laser cutter or CNC mill or 3D printer. It, it still requires, of course, these, these layers. But we don't. It's so, we're, so we're designing, I think, for the first time truly in, in, in three dimensions. With the columns and the, the grotto, it's in surfaces, which are then transformed into volumes, simply because with these volumetric models, the computers are still relatively slow. You would have a lower resolution. But it's, it's arguably a purely 3D designed um, work. You begin with a very kind of fundamental architectural element, and that's the column. Um, and we all know that has a series of historical resonances that are attached to it. And I'm curious how, what you're thinking about that was, taking something really that is kind of fundamental to the discipline of architecture, and then kind of um, really updating that discussion. Well, I'll be honest, it was um, primarily a very pragmatic choice. Um, it was the idea of what can be perceived at an architectural scale, but still be buildable with a limited means. But beyond that, I think the column is interesting because it's always been a showcase of architectural thinking, both technologically and um, aesthetically. For the Greeks and Romans, they were, they were designed according to rules. As, um, as Mario Carpo points out, it was um, Vitruvius who, who didn't provide any drawings, but simply provided the list of steps, essentially an algorithm for the craftsman to perform, to create each column. And then it was the, the craftsman that then improvised and uh, created varieties based on these instructions. And in a way, that's exactly what the computer is doing. You know? In a way, um, we're, we're providing a script allowing essentially thousands of craftsmen as it's running again and again to, to, to improvise and to and create permutations and, and, and variants. Nowadays we can with, with increased processing power we can you know create hundreds and millions of surfaces and it becomes impossible to read how the form is produced I think it's, uh, they don't lend themselves to, to the same sort of reductionism as these early forms. Is that something you embrace in your work? Well, I think it's a question of resolution. And, and the moment one gets higher and higher in resolution, um, what one isn't going to be able to see that. But the subdivision can produce you know, incredibly smooth surfaces, which is um, how it was conceived, as well as very faceted ones, um, which would make it easier to read which process was being used. But the interesting thing is, that it's, it's, I don't think it's necessary to, to reveal these. This process is just a container um, that, that opens up a tremendous possibility space. And one, one needs to set some sort of logic on top of it in order to, to bring some sort of form or order or, or, or structure to it. 
it could be subdivision, but it could also be a, a process of addition that would do the trick, or a process of subtraction, carving out. It's, I think the operation itself isn't as important as the structure you put on top of it that allows you to make, to make some sense of the space that you've opened up. I'd like to thank you very much, Michael, for this fascinating glimpse uh, into the world of what I call hyper-resolution. Your work is really at the forefront of that discussion. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Russell. It's, it's great to be here. Let's get the coming. Let's get the coming.